Hello, I am Jolinda LeClaire, Director of Drug Prevention Policy for Vermont. I oversee the Governor's Opioid Coordination Council, which Governor Phil Scott established by executive order in January 2017. Since then, the Council has focused on its mission to improve Vermont's response to our opioid challenges through prevention, treatment, recovery, and enforcement. This crisis touches everyone in our state. Many Vermonters have family members and loved ones who have become addicted after receiving opioid prescriptions for pain. Others were exposed to opioids and other drugs through friends, dealers, and traffickers. Regardless of how they were exposed, we know we have among us many who now have the chronic, isolating, and too often deadly disease of addiction. We are making progress. Treatment is available across the state through Vermont's nationally known hub and spoke system of treatment. Recovery centers in our communities are providing effective wraparound support to help people achieve long-term recovery. Many communities are building prevention coalitions to provide our children and families the tools they need to be resilient in the face of life's challenges and traumas. Vermont law enforcement has steadily worked to increase community safety and to decrease the supply of illegal drugs. They also work hard to support prevention strategies that will reduce the demand for opioids. There is more we can do and must do to turn the curve on Vermont's opioid challenges. Drug prevention education is a top priority for schools and communities. Increasing intervention opportunities in emergency rooms and other places will help more people enter treatment and recovery. Individuals and families in recovery need support to obtain jobs and rebuild their lives, and support for harm reduction through safe and appropriate use and disposal of drugs and syringes will increase safety in homes and communities. Something we all can do to take every opportunity to raise awareness and reduce stigma by talking about addiction. To highlight the science of addiction, as well as the cultural, social, and economic challenges associated with addiction, the producers and hosts of Vermont Cable Access and the Opioid Coordination Council have created an eight-part series entitled Understanding Vermont's Opioid Crisis, Working Together to Create a More Resilient Community. This first segment in the series is about the science of the brain and addiction. Host Ed Baker and his guest discuss the changes that occur in the brain as the disease of addiction or substance use disorder develops and progresses. They explore what is required to treat those changes and begin the process of recovery, all a part of the Opioid Coordination Council strategies. We hope that this knowledge will help to transform the stigma often associated with addiction. With compassion, long-term treatment, and recovery supports, there is hope. Hi, everybody. I'm Ed Baker, and I'm very happy to be here today with you. Uh, as Jalinda had mentioned in her introduction, uh, this show is part of an eight-part series entitled Understanding Vermont's Opioid Crisis. This particular show's title is Science of the Brain and Addiction. We're going to go into an explanation of what addiction is as it impacts uh, the human brain. And in order to help us understand that, it's my, my pleasure and my honor to introduce our guest, Dr. Peter Jackson. Thanks for having me, Ed. Glad to be here. Thank you for being here, Doctor. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Jackson completed medical school at the University of Utah, and he completed his residency in psychiatry at the University of Michigan. He then completed fellowships in both child and adolescent psychiatry and addiction psychiatry at Massachusetts General Hospital and McLean Hospital, both affiliated with Harvard Medical School. He then joined the faculty at the University of Vermont Larner College of Medicine, where he is an assistant uh, professor in the psychiatry department. And you also um, you, 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 you are also engaged in a clinical practice with this particular population. Is that yeah. correct? Yep. Yep. People yeah. with opioid use disorder. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, two days a week of my practice are pretty much exclusively focused on treating opioid use disorders. All right. So. 
All right. You know, I guess, um, Dr. Jackson, where, I, where I'd like to begin was, is with a little bit of a personal uh, question mm -hmm. to you so the viewing audience can get an idea about what motivates you and, and um, you know, what drew you into this specific specialty. What drew you into addiction psychiatry? Yeah. Well, thanks again for having me. I am happy to be here and happy to answer that question because I love it. Um, uh, when I started medical school, I don't think mental health uh, treatment or substance use treatment was anywhere on my radar at all. Um, and as I went through the, the first couple of years of medical school, as we began to learn in medical school about substance use disorders and addiction and mental health, um, I, I became very intrigued at the way that it impacts uh, individuals and families and people who are connected to them. Um, in medicine, we often talk about a biopsychosocial model, which is uh, basically saying that we should care about not just uh, how a disease impacts people's bodies and their biology, but also their uh, emotional well-being and their functioning in the world. Um, and I found that, um, for me, it, it seems to me that nothing threatens all of those areas of well-being more than a substance use disorder. Um, I, I, I met patients when I uh, first uh, was in my clinical years of medical school. One, one that I remember in particular um, in the intensive care unit at, at the VA hospital um, who was there for cardiac problems related to a long-standing substance use problem. And I remember him saying to me, um, my heart is the least of my worries right now. And he went on to tell me about sort of the destruction that uh, this challenge had left, left behind in his life, in his family, in his work, in his profession. Um, and I remember that, that very well, him sort of um, saying that, yeah, this has impacted my body, but it's impacted my life so much in addition to that. Um, and I, I just have felt, uh, felt an interest in, in working in that area. And I think it's, uh, I'm glad that, it, I'm glad that you're doing the show and glad that we're we're here to talk about it so yes 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 thank you thank you for that uh, your candor and your 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 genuineness that resonates with me and I'm sure that that patient uh, resonated with you mm -hmm. you yeah. know more and more as as I ask that question to people I come into contact with in this particular field I find that it's almost universal that, that somewhere along the line, something resonated and people choose this field. It's almost a calling that they care deeply about human suffering. They want to do something about it. So I wanna, I wanna thank you for listening to that, that voice mm -hmm. inside you that called you. Yeah. You know, the purpose of this show is to explain the science of the brain and addiction. But below that purpose is, is really the purpose of this show and the whole eight-part series. It's to dispel and contribute to the eventual well, uh, eradication of, of stigma, mm -hmm. the stigma associated specifically with, with, with opioid use disorder, all substance use disorder, but, but specifically with opioid use disorder because it's so urgent right now. Yeah. Do you care to speak a little bit about, about stigma? Sure. Yeah, I think we, um, that's a huge problem. It's a huge problem in uh, people not being willing to seek treatment. Um, we have uh, millions of people struggling with this in this country who aren't willing or, or don't feel confident that they could go in and ask for help, and a lot of that's because of stigma. Mm -hmm. They're afraid that um, their, their family would reject them or they would lose their job or they would be kicked out of uh, social circles uh, because of this problem. Um, I'm hopeful that that's moving in a positive direction overall mm -hmm. uh, in our country, um, but it's something that we, we really need to address, not only in the, in the community, but even in the medical profession, yes. Yes. where we need, we need to do a lot more work to train our, our colleagues um, about, about how these uh, illnesses occur and, and what's going on for them. Um, I think you and I talked a little bit about stigma around beginning Mm -hmm. Stigma around the first time that someone ever used a substance, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the stigma about continuing to use a substance, mm -hmm. and so we can include that in our in our conversation as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. 
um, and and uh, you know bring some information that w we ought to use to fight against the stigma Absolutely. of both the beginning of a substance use disorder and the perpetuation of a substance use disorder. Absolutely, and and I want to I want to just say something to the viewing audience is that you know we're all taught you know uh, how to believe or taught uh, how to think, and you know we we seem to have been taught as a culture that addiction somehow is some sort of moral failing or weakness or character flaw or choice. It's not, it's not really our fault that we believe these things because you believe what you're taught. Yeah. So I think, I think our role today, part of our role today is to teach the general public what is addiction? What is substance use disorder? not based on old, um, you know, beliefs that are inaccurate, but more based on current science, uh, the science that's been engaged in by the medical profession over the last 30 years. Yeah. So <clears throat> with that, I'd just like to bring up this concept of choice. A lot of people believe that addiction is a choice, that someone actually chooses of their own free will to engage in behaviors that mm -hmm. uh, lead to addiction. So I guess I would like to address causality first. What do you see, based in science, as the causes of addiction? Sure. Yeah, so I, I mean, that's been part of my area of interest. That's why I did a, <clears throat> a fellowship in working with kids and adolescents. Mm -hmm. Um, because understanding the understanding the causes, understanding the risk factors for addiction is something that can help us a lot mm -hmm. as uh, as uh, professionals, not only to be more empathic and to be less stigmatized and less biased uh, when people uh, come in to seek treatment, but also to educate educate the rest of our medical professional uh, colleagues uh, and understanding better some of the early risk factors. Mm -hmm. We are now starting to understand more and more through science, through imaging, taking pictures, mm -hmm. um, understanding that there are many, many risk factors that contribute uh, to the development of substance use disorders. First and foremost, genetic uh, heritability. Mm -hmm. um, just like other illnesses can run in families, um, substance use disorders can. The heritability, which means a, a rough estimate in what part of this illness do we feel like is related to your genes mm -hmm. and what part do we feel like is related to your environment. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's not just two, two categories of risk factors, but the heritability we think is about 50%. We know is about 50%. It's similar heritability to things like type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. So nobody chooses to get prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. Nobody chooses to have that higher risk. So even just across the general public, we know that there's, due to our genes, there's already a risk there uh, for a lot of individuals, much, much higher than others. And then we look at sort of, you know, uh, the, the genetic influence and we look at the environmental influence mm -hmm. and we're starting to see more and more um, through some big studies like the ACEs study, A-C-E-S, that's Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, um, where anything that you had happen to you in your childhood <laughs> as a negative experience can make you at higher risk for a substance use disorder, for other uh, uh, mental health challenges. Um, so I, do believe, I believe there's actually a, a correlation between the number of adverse childhood experiences a child is exposed to and the likelihood of their developing substance use disorder uh, later in life. Yeah. The more adverse childhood experiences, the more likely you are to develop That's correct. substance use disorder. Yeah. <clears throat> That's correct. So we're talking about things like uh, any type of traumatic experience as a kid, major medical illness, uh, physical abuse, mm -hmm. sexual trauma, mm -hmm. um, major accidents, witnessing violence in the home, witnessing substance use in the home, mm -hmm. all of those things start to stack up and you, um, and you see that, th that there are many individuals out there who have so many risk factors piled up for developing a substance use disorder. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the statistics that I recently um, came across was that a child who is exposed to six or more adverse childhood experiences is actually 46 times more likely uh, to use injectable drugs. Mm -hmm. that's, that's profound. 
it's amazing. Yeah, the, the, the risk factors are, are very powerful and can, can, uh, can really be harmful. And again, that's not a choice. Yeah. Children don't choose what environment uh, to be brought up in or, or what type of um, adverse experience they'll receive from a parent or a stranger. Yeah. They don't. They don't choose that. So what yeah. you're saying is then is that there's a like a genetic component to risk, and an environmental component to risk. Exactly. That it's not a choice. Yeah. yeah, correct. What about what about? Let's continue on that line then. So that's causality, mm -hmm. right? It's not oh that person chooses a life of addiction. You know, you made your bed, you sleep in it. I'm gonna if I'm gonna help you to change your behavior. I'm going to help you change your behavior by punitive, mes uh, yeah. punitive mes me methods. What about uh, continuation? What about the continuation of substance use? Yeah. Is that a choice? Well, we're learning more and more that uh, there are actual biological anatomical changes uh, in the brain that make it increasingly difficult to have uh, executive function, meaning sort of our controlling and our planning. Uh, stage and we, we can we can talk about that. I think I think that idea of you made your bed so sleep in it, mm. um, and the punitive uh, idea we've really seen that fail. Yeah, we've really seen that fail in, in treatment of substance use disorders, um, uh, both both literally because uh, it's uh, it's not helpful, but also empathically and that just perpetuates the bias that Absolutely. we talked about. Absolutely. Um, so maybe uh, if it's okay, we could go take a look at a couple oh, of slides. Yes, absolutely, Doctor. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to pull up uh, a couple of the slides here, and we'll look briefly at this uh, picture. And I wanted to give some credit to my colleagues at the University of Vermont Medical Center, Dr. Michael Gody in particular, who helped uh, put together some of these slides. Um, but briefly, we can go through and look, uh, look, and help the audience to see a little bit about what happens in our brain when we're motivated for something, when we're driven towards something. So everybody has probably heard about positive reinforcement. Basically, when we like something, our brain learns to do more of that um, whenever we feel good about something. So that comes from an area here uh, down in the deeper part of the brain, the brain stem that releases dopamine, which is the main neurochemical mm -hmm. in charge of reward. Um, that passes along to the other parts of our brain involved in our action and our desires to lead us to like that thing and to want that thing and to seek it out and to do more of that. Then we have negative reinforcement, um, which is uh, all, a little bit the opposite, um, where our brain learns that things that feel bad, we don't want to do those things, we don't want to experience those things. Um, so cells in the amygdala um, down here, again, sort of a deeper part of our brain, are stimulated by adverse uh, sensations, adverse thoughts, adverse memories, and we learn uh, to uh, experience anxiety, fear, distress, and then we tend to avoid those things uh, that, that, that cause the anxiety and fear and stress, um, and we tend to want to do the things that relieve anxiety, fear, and distress. Um, this frontal part of our brain, kind of up in the front behind your forehead, uh, is related to our attention, um, sort of our cognitions and thinking through things, judgment, planning, they call it the executive uh, part of our brain um, in the prefrontal cortex. So this positive reinforcement center and this negative reinforcement center um, both have connections and messages here that our brain over time learns cues, um, learns, uh, learns things that are going to trigger those reward pathways. So the classic experiment with Pavlov's dogs where the bell rings and they begin to salivate, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that happens uh, in, in human brains. Uh, and then over time we see, we see that change and strengthen so that those cues become even more salient, they, they respond more quickly, they, um, they trigger us more deeply. Um, right here, I just wanted to put in here the don't think but act part of things, and that brings up an important point where <clears throat> there are parts of our brain that we want to function automatically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if I were to uh, go out with you on the highway 
mm -hmm. and blindfold you and take you and stand you in the middle of the highway mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and took off the blindfold and you saw a truck coming at you. Right. You don't mm -hmm. want to sit there and kind of think and, hmm, should I run, should I not run? Mm -hmm. You want something to kick in automatically and off you go Absolutely. and you run. So it's normal that we have some level of automatic occurrence in our brain. And so that's what happens here with, with uh, the anxiety and fear and distress signals is that often those sort of bypass the thinking and planning and executive part of our brain and create a behavior or a reaction or a release of certain neurochemicals that make us, make us do things. Right, so, right. Yeah. Well, that is um, a really interesting uh, description of, of this brain disease and opens the, the door to, to, to many avenues. So what, 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 I, what I hear you saying is that there are actual uh, neurotransmissions, brain chemicals that are released um, in conjunction with the self-administration of drugs. Mm -hmm. And that that process hijacks or subverts normal functioning. Mm -hmm. so, that, so that something that's been programmed through evolution and Mother Nature herself for survival becomes subjected to what we call addictive behaviors. Yeah, yeah. So the memory of food would be replaced with the memory of the ex drug experience. Yeah. With, with the same kind of um, importance. Mm -hmm. I need food. If I don't get food, I'm going to starve to death. Yeah. So the person with addiction <clears throat> has that same kind of feeling, that same kind of emotion. I need drugs. If I don't get drugs, I'm going to die. Yeah. How ironic that is. Yeah. I like that word hijacked that you used, and it's a, it's a very appropriate word mm -hmm. because uh, indeed um, these centers, these, these reward centers, um, these stress and anxiety centers definitely do get hijacked. If, if we could look at one more slide to sort of yes, show us absolutely. some pictures. Um, let me pull this up. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some pictures. <clears throat> I think sometimes we, we want to see something to believe something. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's part of the bias, I think, that can happen in the field of addiction. If you break your arm and go into the doctor, take an x-ray, take a picture, yep, there it's broken. Mm -hmm. You know, we see it, we're ready to fix it. Uh, and so for a long, long time, uh, we uh, haven't been able to see anything. Uh, but that's not the case anymore. We're learning more and more through science, through good research, yeah. and we're able to see uh, what's going on. So that's a little bit what I can show you in this, uh, in this slide. So this is a, a picture basically of the reward centers of the brain. Mm -hmm. um, up here above uh, the top one, you can see sort of those darker orange sections mm -hmm. um, down in the reward center of the brain. That's, the, that's them lighting up basically and responding regularly to rewards. When you see this bottom picture with the two yellow spots, that's, that's after somebody has had a prolonged period of chronic opioid use, in this case chronic heroin use and you see it's a little bit cooler meaning that part of the brain's not lighting up as much um, and so the reward center has actually been desensitized it's been dampened the things that should cause you joy don't cause you as much joy as they used to and so your ability to seek out and find other healthy behaviors has literally become dampened it's happened uh, it's happened in your brain and then if you look uh, if we look over here to the other side to the amygdala. So the amygdala is one of the parts of our, uh, parts of our brain that's um, responsible for uh, anxiety, stress, and fear. So you, this is uh, a little bit of a, a, a double hit <coughs> where you have the reward center that's desensitized and dampened mm -hmm. and you have the stress and anxiety center that you can see here and you know these are, these are difficult and I'm not an expert uh, neuro, uh, neuroimaging person at, by any means. But you can see the, the white areas where uh, that, that part of the brain is lighting up um, for stress. You can see uh, that it's lighting up, flashing more uh, in the case of, again, chronic opioid use. So if you can imagine having a combination of not being able to enjoy things that you wish you could enjoy or used to enjoy as much, your reward center is dampened, and then your stress center is 
active <coughs> and uh, bothered all of the time. Um, it's uh, it's a really unfortunate uh, situation, and uh, and it's we can see it. Absolutely, it's, it's absolutely, and that's the the science that we're speaking of that shows us that addiction or the continuation of addiction is not a choice. It's a compulsion. And the way you describe it is so impactful. The double hit, mm -hmm. as you say. The person is experiencing life. Life is gray. Mm -hmm. Life is no longer pleasurable. Yeah. So they want um, to have that experience of pleasure uh, again. And the brain remembers drugs. Yep. That's one very powerful motivation. On the other side, internally, there's anxiety, stress, negative feelings caused by what you d defined as the extended amygdala, also pushing for relief. So yeah. there's a, a drive toward positive reinforcement, a drive toward negative reinforcement, both very powerful. Yeah. So if, if, if I believe that addiction is a choice, <clears throat> then I can look at what you just said and say, okay, so there's a double hit, there's a very, very powerful motivation for the person to re-engage in the self-administration of drugs. If they don't want to do it, why don't they just not do it? Yeah, well, that, again, that's been uh, sort of a, a, perpetuated, uh, a perpetuated feeling that leads to frustration, that leads to discouragement, that leads to anger. Um, I think even people that work in the in the area of substance use treatment ha have those moments where we fall back to just stop mm -hmm. you know, uh, just why, say why just say no yeah just say no <clears throat> um, but understanding this uh, is is important to uh, to maintain our compassion and to maintain our empathy and to fight back that bias and stigma I think we do need to be a little bit careful to uh, make sure that uh, we don't believe that this is so automatic that people can't change because that's one of the beautiful things we can talk more about is um, people can recover, people oh, can with treatment and help, um, you know, and have one, recovery. And one of, the, one of the other aspects, so along, along with this, that idea of choice, why doesn't a person just say no? Speak a little bit about prefrontal um, impairment, mm -hmm. like the person's inability to really say no. Mm -hmm. You might have a person with this double hit that you've described that with every fiber of their being, yeah. they don't want to go out and purchase a drug. Yeah. And their, 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 their brain is telling them, no, don't do it. Do something else. Yeah. You, th this is destroying your life. What is it about this compulsion where the, the person actually does not have the neurotransmissions to actually say no? Yeah, yeah. I, I imagine everybody could think back in their life to find a time where they did something that they didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, you're right about the prefrontal cortex, so the frontal part of our brain uh, that's uh, kind of the executive part and the mm -hmm. planning part and the decision-making part. That, we didn't, uh, we didn't uh, bring that up on the neuroimaging slides, but that part can actually be weakened mm -hmm. to where literally the part of your brain that's, um, that's uh, helping you uh, with inhibitory control that's helping you think twice about that decision, um, that's helping you regulate your actions and behaviors because of the automaticity, that, that sort of nature of it, uh, of it continuing through a, a triangle and bypassing that part of the brain, mm -hmm. um, that it, it doesn't engage as well, uh, it's not as effective. Um, and so, but again, like we talked about, it can become more effective again. It will, we'll see a little bit more as we talk that these parts of our brain can recover, can heal. With actual so. uh, healing on, a, on the level of uh, like a neuronal level, actually yeah. brain circuits yeah. healing. Yeah. I've heard that described as um, like the, the double hit described as the go system. Go. Per, get that drug. Mm -hmm. And then the prefrontal described as the stop system. Mm -hmm. So there's a, an incredibly powerful go system, and there's a literal breakdown in the stop system. Yeah. So the person really, against their own will, will go out and um, continue uh, to take drugs <clears throat> because of actual measurable brain impairment. It's not, not a choice. Yeah. I think that... Um the people affected by substance use disorders are as surprised, if not more surprised, than their family members, than their providers. 
at um, this this uh, at the lengths that they would go to to continue using a substance. Mm -hmm. um, it seems baffling to us. It's baffling to them at times. They they. Um, they will have uh, so much adverse uh, experience. They'll have so much, so many consequences, and uh, and be uh, frankly baffled uh, yeah. that they'll continue to um, seek out that substance or seek out that behavior. Um, all, all the more reason uh, for our compassion, for our um, adequately funding early intervention and continuing care. Yeah, the more the more we look at addiction today, the more we realize it, it is a chronic brain disease. Mm -hmm. It's not an acute occurrence like a broken arm, you know, where you go and get a set, you get a painkiller, you exercise, do physical therapy, and life is back to normal. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about your broken arm ever again. Yeah, that that's acute, chronic, and with the, the this disease model, chronic disease model of addiction. Compassion calls for recovery supports over the lifespan yeah. and sometimes extended treatment. Sometimes it takes a long time for a person's brain to actually heal so they can be safe yeah. and not uh, subjected to the recurrence of the self-administration of drugs. Do yeah. we want to talk a little bit about that, about recovery and about brain healing or treatment, first treatment. What yeah. kinds of treatment are available for people specifically with opioid use disorder? Yeah, yeah, there, uh, there are really effective treatments, mm -hmm. uh, and we're learning more and more about them. Um, if you uh, sort of overly simplify it, you can identify it as uh, therapeutic treatments, um, uh, individual therapy, group therapy, um, and those types of efforts. And then there's also pharmacologic treatments, medications uh, that can be really helpful, mm -hmm. um, particularly for opioid use disorders. There aren't medications that are helpful for uh, every category of substance use disorders, but for opioid use disorders in particular, um, really uh, there are benefits to the, the medication treatments that are available. Um, uh, you know, viewers have uh, likely heard of uh, methadone or buprenorphine. Mm -hmm. um, those are medications that are um, designed to target the similar, uh, the same receptors uh, that the opioids uh, hit. Um, buprenorphine in particular is a medication that's made to target those receptors, sort of calm them mm -hmm. in my mind, mm -hmm. um, to do a partial stimulating of those receptors, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but can't sort of fully, fully open the door basically. It's kind of like partially opening the door mm -hmm. so that the receptors can be sort of stabilized and, and, and it controls a little bit some of that automatic uh, anxiety and distress that one is feeling when they're having a withdrawal uh, okay. uh, experience. All right. um, and, uh, and, and really stabilize them. The, and again, we're talking about biology. We're talking about uh, psychological and sociological factors to treatment. And so I mentioned that biopsychosocial yeah, yeah. Um, uh, model that we talk about in medicine, the treatment follows the same thing, the bio, psycho, social type of treatments, and I talk with individuals often when they come in about that, um, but we certainly have some good research and some good data about the bio biological treatment, which we can do with uh, medications, and then we add on those, um, those other uh, interventions like the therapeutic interventions, and then other ways that people uh, start to make changes in their life. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so the idea then with opioid use disorder would be to avoid withdrawal from 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 opioids. Mm -hmm. uh, we know is incredibly uncomfortable. Yes, muscle cramps, uh, body cramps, uh, nausea, shaking, sweating, chills. So people are kind of driven mm -hmm. uh, to to continue to self-administer yeah. opioids. It's one of the double hits yeah. that you were talking about. So the idea with medication then, or buprenorphine and methadone in particular, mm -hmm. is to, to give the patient the exact dose of an opioid that would interact with the receptors in the brain that would prevent them or protect them from going into withdrawal, mm -hmm. while that same dose would be low enough to avoid what we call opioid intoxication. The person would be stabilized. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's, uh, it's about the dose, but it's also about the way the medicine's made. It's not a medicine that can fully sort of uh, stimulate those receptors all the way like, like uh, uh, opioids can, mm -hmm. uh, like heroin could. Mm -hmm. um, it's a medication that, that, can, that can stabilize the receptors to a partial mm -hmm. sort of activation. Buprenorphine. Uh, buprenorphine, yeah. yeah. And then the person would engage in other related therapies if yeah. they needed them. Yeah, yeah. And I think, um, you know, there's one thing that's important about our field is as you look across the, the, uh, the treatment recommendations, the available forms of treatment, no, there's not one sort of snapshot or there's not uh, one cookie cutter model yeah. that's perfect for everybody, yeah. but you look in those different categories and you decide with somebody yeah. what's right for them, what's going to feel right for them. But you mentioned, uh, you mentioned opioids in particular in the withdrawal. Uh, it's, um, it's unique among substances uh, for that. Um, more than any other substance out there is what happens when there's a physiological dependence um, is, is such a horrendous experience in someone's body. Uh, and that's why I think it's uh, fantastic that we have now treatments that can help people stabilize through that part, stabilize cravings and then be able to put in all those, all those other things. I had a patient uh, in the office just this morning, an individual who was in tears telling me about trying, trying to stop mm -hmm. and how horrendous, how horrendous it is despite all the motivation, despite all the desire, despite um, how uh, desperately that individual mm -hmm. ha had, had yeah. wanted to, to stop. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, just the experience and how, how sick uh, that individual became. And what, and what a poignant example of exactly what we're talking about. She's in your office crying, wanting to stop, so that front part of the brain is working. Mm -hmm. I really want to stop, doctor. But those other, that double hit is forcing her to continue. And I think in part of your notes that I, I reviewed, you said that there are, uh, were approximately 23 million people in America with substance use disorder, approximately 10% receiving treatment. And all the more reason for our culture to grow compassion around this disease yeah. and get these people, get these, welcome these people into adequate, adequate health care. Absolutely. Especially when you look at opioids and the, the fatality or the morbidity. Yeah. The people dying out there every day from, from uh, you know, both licit and illicit uh, opioid, opioid yeah. use. Didn't you, did you have a slide on, um, on, on treatment? Yeah, yep, yeah, let's take a look at that. Um, this is a little bit what we, what we just talked about. Um, there's behavioral treatment, if you lump that together, kind of thinking about mm -hmm. uh, therapy, um, uh, the decisions that people are making, learning new behaviors, trying to manage their environment, making changes that are likely to help them be successful. That sometimes means um, changing some of your relationships. Some people try to change where they live. Mm -hmm. um, and so we try to reinforce and help that executive part of the brain thinking, uh, planning, and, uh, nice. and working through it. At the same time, we're looking down here where we talked, uh, talked earlier in the deeper parts of the brains where nobody can think themselves out <laughs> Mm -hmm. of that type of withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And so again, this is, this is imaging, this is an image to help us understand um, the, uh, the efficacy of simultaneously including behavioral components of treatment and pharmacologic components of treatment. And if we look, um, if it's okay with you, if we look at the oh, yes. uh, next slide, um, mm -hmm. I love to see this picture um, because we actually can see, again, sometimes we want to see it to believe it, we can sometimes see um, with these images that we can recover. Mm -hmm. This brain can become healthy again. So the first one, again, uh, a normal uh, brain with those darker orangish red areas um, in the reward centers firing normally. Um, at about one month of abstinence from an opioid use disorder, still seeing those cool parts of the brain sort of not reacting normally. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in this last picture, 14 months of abstinence. So. You mentioned the need to, uh, for long-term treatment. Mm -hmm. This is 14 months, so that's a long time. Mm -hmm. But you can mm -hmm. see that reward center uh, in the brain lighting up again in those orange and red colors uh, like it normally should. So then, so then doctor, that, that, this person whose brain we're looking at now, at that 14, 
month mark where the uh, uh, dopamine receptors are enlivened, the brain is functioning relatively normally, that person would begin to feel pleasure in life at the more healthy and natural rewards that life offers. Yeah. All right? Yeah. And over the, over the course of life, say maybe an extent, because I, I know a lot of people in recovery. I know people in recovery for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. And these people, uh, they are healthy. They don't ever really think of drugs anymore. They never have cravings. Maybe once in a while there'll be a mild craving mm -hmm. because of some environmental cue or maybe a whiff of marijuana or they'll see bourbon or something. There'll be an idea, yeah. but there is no compulsion, no strong drive whatsoever because it, 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 their brain is reorganized around yeah. life. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we have the science, we have uh, the information to sort of the, to back that up. Um, and to see, uh, it's, it's delightful to see and to know and to talk with individuals about that all of those parts of our brain that we've talked about, the deep parts of our brain, the fr frontal kind of executive part of our brain, mm -hmm. um, they, can, they can recover. Um, and that the joy you speak of in my, because I was a clinician for 30 years, I've worked with this population, and, and I understand that joy that you're talking about, that the person is finally congruent. I am living in line with the values that make me who I am. Yeah. I am no longer going against those values because I had addiction. Yeah. Now I have the freedom really to make the kind of choices that I want to make in life. Yeah, yeah. I, I hear people use that word all the time, freedom. Yeah. Um, uh, and they, they can get there, they can experience that. Um, uh, freedom to enjoy the things that they want to enjoy. Freedom to use their time for productive, healthy things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a, lot, there's a lot of recovering people because of anonymity, though. We don't know who they are. There are a lot of recovering people around who have become such uh, contributors to this movement. We see people in Alcoholics Anonymous, yeah. Narcotics Anonymous, seven days a week supporting each other, having meetings, helping people find this one pathway into recovery. Recovery is a beautiful, beautiful thing. But very often it starts or, and, and is not possible without without uh, treatment, yeah, medical yeah. treatment. Yep, yeah. Now, did you want to speak a little bit? We, we're, we have a few minutes left. I know that you have um, uh, training in, in, in adolescent psychiatry mm -hmm. and also in addiction psychiatry. Yeah. And uh, from one of our conversations earlier, I know the importance that you place on, and rightfully so, on, on adolescence as a, like a risk period in life. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I do. Um, it's, uh, it's one of the areas where my sort of strongest passion lies, so I'm glad, glad to talk about that a little bit. Um, and something that I, I often feel like sh sort of shouting from the rooftops. Um, we'll, we'll look at a, a couple of slides, but um, the earlier somebody is exposed to substances, the higher the risk of developing a substance use disorder. Uh, and there's a lot that we know about neurobiology, about the anatomy of the brain uh, that teaches us that. Um, so maybe I'll show another couple of slides. I hope so. Um, this is a slide, so synaptic pruning. Um, our, our brains, when we're born, um, have neurons that aren't as connected as they're going to be later in life. And so if you think, uh, if you think about <clears throat> a new brain as, as not very sort of connected and not wired uh, to itself in as many ways. Children are starting to connect and attach to everything. Um, and so you see this brain at seven years of age, it looks like a little bit like chaos. Uh, you know, things are just, all the neurons want to talk to all the other neurons. And then in our teenage years, what happens is we start to prune. If you think about sort of trimming back a tree, we start to prune out what we're going to uh, not need. Mm -hmm. um, so we come primed uh, as little kids, ready to, you know, learn Japanese or learn English. We learn. We're ready to learn a bike. We're ready to learn the trumpet or learn the violin. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, in that way, we're also more prone and more ready to uh, reinforce or learn negative things mm -hmm. in our life. So the earlier that that exposure happens, the more vulnerable the brain is. Um, this slide I'll explain very briefly, um, but. Basically, as the brain becomes more blue in this picture, obviously our brains aren't blue, 
but as it becomes more blue in this imaging picture, that's just a more mature brain. And you talked about stop and go. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Teenagers, go centers, sure. um, get efficient and get, get uh, developed sooner than the stop centers. Mm -hmm. And there are reasons for that. Teenagers don't just have, you know, broken adult brains or half-baked brains. There, there are reasons for that. And, but I see these as sort of amazingly vulnerable brains that are learning over time um, as, they, as the neurons develop. The neurons can, can pass signals a thousand times faster than they could when they were first developed. Wow. And they can send the signal 300 times more often wow. um, in their brain. Wow. And so any, any young person, their brain is basically developing. And while it's developing, it's a much, much higher risk. Um, and so I'll show just a couple of these uh, graphs. Here is a, is a graph that shows sort of for those that went on later in life to develop uh, a substance use disorder, when that started. And you see that happening in the, in the mid to late teens. Um, and here, just talking about prevalence of substance use disorders. So look how big of an increase there is from, you know, middle school into high school and then by the end of high school is when substance use disorders are happening. So lastly, I guess I would just show that just this immensely uh, increased risk of developing a substance use disorder the earlier you start. So if you, if an individual is exposed to substances before 15, which sadly many of the people that we work with had been, um, there's almost a 30 percent chance of developing a substance use disorder compared to a much, much smaller uh, wow. chance if people never uh, expose or never experience or are exposed to substances in their early life. That's incredible. So, That's incredible. So the message then, and, and we all know it, is that, I mean, because we've been adolescents, the, the adults in the viewing audience know it, is that adolescence is a very, very difficult developmental time yeah. to introduce the self-administration of psychoactive chemicals during that time is extremely risky. Yeah. And, and I think we need to note that we're not talking really about opioids at this point. Now we're talking about tobacco. Yep. We're talking about vaping, mm -hmm. nicotine. We're talking about beer. Yep. We're certainly talking about marijuana. Yes. You know, marijuana interferes with the endocannabinoid system, which is responsible for connectivity during brain development. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, you know, these drugs, all these psychoactive chemicals, and some of them we'd become kind of friendly with, we don't think they're that dangerous. Yeah. They are dangerous. So the parents, you know, in the audience really need to understand that. Yeah. Prevention programs, we need to put money into prevention programs. Yeah. I can see that, why that's your, uh, your burning desire and your, your passion. Yeah. There's so much opportunity there for, for lasting success and preventive work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we spend much, much more money, time, and energy on treatment than we, than we do on prevention, and we've got to keep both in mind. So, you know, we don't have, we have only a, a few minutes left now. Um, I guess I'd like to just have one comment on, you know, you know, we have the, the medical profession and we have uh, the, the counseling profession. Uh, we have uh, prevention out there. The, the, what, what, what do you see as um, like the importance of the community really getting behind this now at, at this point in our history? It seems like there really is a sea change occurring. We're on TV talking about it. Mm -hmm. The Governor's Council is studying it. More money is being poured into it. We're, we're doing something about it. Yeah. What do you see as the importance of community involvement? Regular, regular people, our viewing audience, do you think that's important for them to support this? Yeah, I absolutely do. And we, we talked about bias. We talked about stigma. Um, individuals who have struggled with this need support. They need support not just in a doctor's office, but they need support in the community. Um, I think I think we are seeing a sea change, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, coming through my training, I feel like uh, I feel optimistic uh, at this time. I feel like uh, both public policy, um, uh, insurance coverage, 
um, uh, decrease in bias amongst medical professionals and amongst the community. I feel like we're moving in a good direction, yeah. and we just need to we just need to keep keep going. I I share that with you. I'm so happy to be a part of this. We had a recovery walk in Burlington this past summer, mm -hmm. and it was a bunch of recovering people. I'm in recovery myself. A bunch of recovering people. We had our t-shirts on. We were marching down Church Street, yeah. and all the all the people. Uh, shoppers, tourists, uh, Vermonters, passers-by, we're all screaming, yay, you know, keep it up, yeah. nice going. And it was just uh, a real cultural sea change that we need to really apply effort now to keep this moving um, in the right direction. I agree yeah. with you 100%. I guess um, in closing, I'd like you to, um, you know, remark or just talk to the viewing audience what would you like to say in, in closing doctor um i guess i'd i guess i'd like to say uh, maybe i'll recount a story briefly um when i started my clinical years of medical school literally the very first patient i saw um the very first morning of my very first <laughs> clinical day um, was an individual who'd been struggling with all kinds of infections all kinds of infections, and no, nobody could uh, figure out for a while what had been going on. This person had uh, been in the hospital many times, and they were looking for autoimmune diseases, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and one morning when the nurse walked into the room, they found the patient um, using an opioid illicitly. Mm -hmm. And um, I saw the most disappointing um, and discouraging change come over the treatment team and the people interacting with that person where for some reason if this had been an autoimmune disorder we were going to rally to this person's support and we were going to we were going to fight uh, with uh, with them and their family and then all of a sudden when it came to light that it was likely related to a substance use disorder um, people seemed to want to give up and get angry and be frustrated sure. um, I feel like that was an interesting experience for me um, the individual's family member, their spouse, was one of the few people who, to me, didn't, didn't turn um, and didn't, didn't change their desire to stand by this person and work with them, which I thought was remarkable. And so I think the message that I, that I would encourage us all is that these, uh, this is an illness. Um, this is a disease process. Um, it's something that we now, we now can see, that we're understanding better and better. Um, it's something that's treatable. It's something that we should cheer for and cheer on. Um, and uh, individuals should feel um, welcomed into treatment. They shouldn't feel shunned when they disclose this to somebody. Um, and, and we should, we should like, like in that walk that you had, yeah. we should be cheering this on uh -huh. like crazy. Um, oh, because <clears throat> it, it, can, it can be so, so destructive. And when people recover, it's an amazing <clears throat> thing to watch. Thank you. I thank you. And I would just like to invite uh, the audience. Uh, there are eight uh, segments to this particular show, and I want to I thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here today yeah. and uh, for your dedication. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank it's you. been great to be here. Thank you.